Hello, and welcome to this Automation World webinar on connecting operations and information technology to enable end-to-end -end data interoperability. This webinar is sponsored by HiveMQ, a supplier of MQTT broker technology. Now, it's well known for businesses in every area that the ability to access and leverage data is what enables a company not only to thrive, but remain relevant today. And in the manufacturing and processing industries, the data we get day in and day out from factory equipment to SCADA and MES systems can be combined to create a competitive advantage. So that's why having seamless bi-directional data flow and end-to-end -end data interoperability are critical to successful industrial Internet of Things applications. But recognizing the importance of operations data is one thing, getting IT and OT systems to talk to each other, as well as to the cloud and the edge, can still be challenging. So to explain how new technology is helping to simplify this OT to IT connection, we have Dominic Obermeyer, the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of HiveMQ, joining me for this webinar. Now, in his presentation today, Dominic will explain how connecting your legacy industrial IoT systems and applications can deliver plug-and-play interoperability, how the MQTT Spark Plug specification breaks down data silos in an industrial IoT environment, and how companies in different industries are using MQTT Spark Plug to modernize their industrial IoT architectures. Now, at the end of his presentation, we will have a Q&A session, so feel free to enter your questions for Dominic at any point during the webinar. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Dominic. Yeah, thank, thank you so much uh, for the introduction. So. Um, as I think already mentioned, my name is Dominic Obermeier. I am the CTO and co-founder of HiveMQ. So for people who want to connect after the webinar, feel free to reach out to me over email and also feel free to reach out to me over LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect and happy to have any follow-up conversations uh, you, um, you have. So um, yeah, so I've been working with Internet of Things technology for quite some time. I also wrote a book um, about that and also helped with the specification of a technology called MQDT. And these days I'm also involved in uh, the specification of a technology called Sparkplug, which we'll cover also today. And, um, and here in my company, I am uh, helping our customers succeed. So we've been um, doing this now for quite some time, for more than 10 years, uh, connecting literally millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of devices, uh, machines, and um, IoT things in general, um, uh, yeah, over in a secure way. So more than 130 customers currently trust HiveMQ with their mission-critical workloads from automotive brands like Audi, BMW, but also American OEMs, um, who um, rely on HiveMQ with their production processes as well as their connected car solutions. Uh, but of course, also companies like, like Siemens, uh, Daimler, and uh, also broadcasting companies like Liberty Global. But we also have customers like Netflix who are also relying on HiveMQ to connect like millions of things and applications. Um, yeah, and, and basically improve their their workloads so our company recently also raised um, almost 50 million euros in c and series a funding uh, based on the traction we've shown in the recent years and also recently we've been awarded by frost and sullivan as the entrepreneurial company of the year uh, in the manufacturing space so um pretty exciting times ahead for iot technologies but also for modernizing manufacturing which is a huge part of actually what we do these days. So when it comes to, to the future of manufacturing, and this, this is very likely not news to anybody here, um, a lot of things happened in the last years, technology breakthroughs, uh, who uh, were really basically um, invented and, and they now are available, 
for basically anybody in the manufacturing industries. So on different, on different um, things, like for example, in automation, but also when it comes to cybersecurity, advanced analytics, AI and machine learning, cloud computing and smart sensors, all of these things, everybody who's, who's running um, manufacturing side, these are the things uh, you very likely have heard and uh, hopefully also have, have projects in order to, to modernize um, the, basically the, the processes uh, in, in your factory. So the business drivers we usually see with our customers is on the one side they want to improve their factory efficiency and very often this involves optimizing the internal plant logistics but also more flexible manufacturing is really something that a lot of companies are looking for. And uh, lot size one, one manufacturing is a huge topic for many industries we work with. And a big topic we see all the time is in the ones that measuring, it, but also increasing the overall equipment effectiveness and efficiency. And so th what this means is, it's about increasing the availability of uh, equipment by avoiding non plant standstill, but also it's about analyzing and increasing quality, but also about tuning the performance of the machines and the processes. So this is something we, s we see with a lot of customers. And let's, let's say it like that. So there are many challenges while modernizing is on the agenda very often there's still a, a problem when it comes to the technologies used, used here um, in order to fulfill these kind of business drivers. And one of the main reasons uh, is that there is a lot of data silos. What this means is there are multiple applications, there are multiple machines, there are multiple vendors also um, who don't really integrate very well and where it's pretty hard to, uh, to connect things in an interoperable way. And this has been for a very long time. Especially in the OT world, this is still, let's say, very accepted and there's still many vendors out there who are really not into connecting things, um, especially outside of their own ecosystem and brand. And this is in huge contrast to what we see a lot with the IT companies um, or pure software companies where data integration is really a key. In the OT world, this is still something that many companies are struggling with uh, because of this kind of data silos. And what we see here is what I personally call a so-called spaghetti architecture, is that while one tries to connect all of the systems, this is usually done in a point-to-point -point fashion. This means, um, all of these systems get connected one by one and this really gets unmaintainable, unmaintainable very fast because you connect all these systems in a way uh, one to one and then you get this nice bowl of spaghetti which is nice if you go to an Italian restaurant but you sure, certainly do not want to have this if you run a business uh, that you get this unmaintainable uh, mess of integrations and this is something that um, many companies are struggling with these days so what does this look like? So this is a very simplistic architecture you will see in a lot of factories worldwide these days. So what you see here on the left side are systems that belong more on the OT side of things, where on the right side you have the IT systems. And so what you will see um, nowadays is that there are systems like manufacturing execution systems, very often historian systems are involved, analytic systems, uh, of course SCADA systems, um, but also in general applications that need to consume data, um, do something with the data and then present to stakeholders or to other systems. On the left side you see basically what you will find in any factory. You will see PLCs, um, devices in general, uh, gateways that are abstracting away other technologies, for example, Modbus or OPC UA, um, sometimes even an analog input or digital input and output, um, and of course, other devices and sensors. And this is a very simplistic view. Uh, if you look at the basically the plans, 
of the OT systems in most factories, this will be, of course, much more complicated and complex. And here in the middle, what you see is this PLC is connected to a SCADA system, to the MES, and so on. And this gets a huge unmaintainable mess. Good luck changing something there, adding new systems, maintaining systems, or even uh, changing things. And in the past, very often, this was not a huge deal, but these days there are so many, is, things are so fast moving, new applications need to get deployed so very often, new data sources need to get introduced and so on, uh, in order to fulfill the business needs. And this is getting messy very easily. So when we come to the challenges of many of the current architectures, you see it's difficult to change workflows and processes. It's also difficult to set up new systems and um, even facilities, of course, and it's difficult to analyze data across the entire system. And it gets really messy and really complicated if multiple sites are involved and if one wants, let's say, a centralized view of data across basically all the factories worldwide. And uh, so we've been working with very large customers uh, in different verticals. For example, also in the automotive space, where they have a lot of factories worldwide and they want to get a centralized view of data. They want to set up new systems easily and seamlessly and then also profit um, from the data by bringing it all together in an in a architecture where you can basically add new use cases as you need it and analyze data as you need it. So the goals for modernization, you see very often, is on the one side, agile software delivery into factories. People who are familiar with cloud computing understand what agility really brings, brings today. Modern agility brings uh, basically the ability to deploy software as up to multiple times per day, uh, change code as needed, and very often this leads to faster mean time to recovery. Um, what this also brings is enabling a centralized command and control. It also enables visualization of oral manufacturing processes. And this is especially useful if multiple sites and multiple factories are involved. And also it brings a consistent and flexible software architecture that is maintainable and that can be used for the coming years. Because any change that is being done today, let's be realistic, needs to be deployed for the next 40 years, um, sometimes even more. And having the possibility to update things as one goes and, and also learn and grow of the use cases is something that is invaluable and should be a goal for anybody modernizing the architectures today. And what most companies are really looking for is a very simple, streamlined and decoupled architecture. So also here, compare with the picture before. So here we also have on the OT side with devices, PLCs, gateways, and a lot of different technologies, OPC UAE, Modbus, and so on. But also on the right side, you see there's also, of course, an MES system, the historians, analytic systems, applications, and so on. And here in the middle, you see this gray circle. What companies are looking for is having this kind of central data broker that is able to move messages where they need to be in a decoupled way. So you don't have a single point-to-point -point connection between a gateway and an MES system anymore. But basically, you have this kind of data hub that makes it possible to get the data as you need it and you can put put the data in um, when an application, a PLC or a gateway wants to. And so you get this nice decoupled architecture. This is what companies are very often looking for today. And how do companies do that? Yeah, this is where we enter the world of MQTT. Because MQTT gives you exactly that. A decoupled architecture that allows you to publish, subscribe, and subscribe data as one needs. And I will go into the details now what this means. But first of all, let me introduce you to MQTT. What is it actually? And why should you even care? 
So first of all, MQTT is a standard binary published subscriber messaging protocol. It is designed for fast and reliable data transport. And it was basically built for monitoring oil pipelines um, in 1999. So it's a pretty old communication protocol compared to many other things. But it got a huge revival after 2010 because when it comes to connecting things, either over the internet or also locally, it turns out to be the perfect technology because of the so-called publish subscribe architecture, um, which we'll cover in a second. And MQTT works in wired environments, but also especially when you have unreliable environments where there is network connectivity that is not good. Um, for example, um, if there is a, a, a factory on, or an, an oil site somewhere remote, uh, chances are that the connectivity is very bad or sometimes there's even only satellite communication available. And MQTT allows you to send data under any circumstance, um, even over these kind of networks. It's built on top of TCP IP and it's the ideal communication protocol for the Internet of Things. And um, many of the Fortune 500 companies today use MQTT to move data in the factory, but also from factory to cloud and from factory to factory um, worldwide um, on literally all um, continents in the world with the same technology, with a streamlined data movement model. And this is pretty huge. So very likely many people here have already heard about MQDT and if not, I invite you to, um, there's a lot of great content available online. So I invite you to Google for keywords like uh, MQDT Essentials, uh, which will either bring you a video series or PDFs where you can dive deep into that and blog post series. So uh, this is like a, any software architect or any decision maker that wants to get the gist of the MQT technology, um, feel free to also uh, dive deep into the details um, here. So, but even using MQTT, which a lot of companies are doing, just use plain MQTT in their factories, there are still some issues with MQTT as a core technology. And this is because a bit of semantics is not available that one actually wants because MQTT uh, is used in factories, but as well as for connecting cars, uh, for connecting um, home appliances, and basically for connecting everything in the world. The great thing is MQTT is um, data agnostic, which is great. But when you, when you want, when it comes to factories, you really want to have this plug and play experience. And uh, this is where MQTT alone is usually not enough because devices and endpoints have different topics, payloads and data structures. So this means if you buy, um, let's say devices from different vendors, even if they support MQTT, very likely they use different data formats. They haven't um, really de defined a joint so-called topic structure in order the topic namespace basically uh, and so on. So this is a huge problem. And also applications are assuming specific formats and structures. This means if you have, for example, a historian application, um, they might uh, need a specific data format so they can read the data and properly. And one of the key advantages, advantages of MQTT, which is it's data agnostic, um, is also a weakness when it comes to connecting factories and applications there. Uh, because, as I said, the payload must be, must be interpreted, but there is really no context. So when it comes to factories, there is still a gap here and there's still something missing. And this is where Sparkplug comes into play. So Sparkplug is a communication protocol on top of MQTT. And it uses MQTT as a core technology, but it adds additional goodies on top. And by the way, Sparkplug, the main idea of Sparkplug comes from the same inventors as from MQTT. 
So um, this is something that really the experts who have been doing that for basically more than, than 20, almost 30 years, um, also all brought the experience into Sparkplug. So uh, they can create something that uh, has the goal of being a simple and an open specification that will enable plug and play interoperability between IIoT devices and IIoT applications. So it's really about plug and play. So with Sparkplug, any kind of Sparkplug uh, supported application, any kind of vendor that is supporting Sparkplug out of the box, and there are many of them, um, they can just plug and play and you can use all of these devices, you can use all of these applications together in order uh, to create uh, yeah, a kind of so-called um, unified namespace that allows you to, to interact with the applications and with the devices and with the PLCs and so on, and then bring all of that together. And before we get dive into the details, there is also great content available from companies like Chevron who modernized their whole infrastructure with Sparkplug. So there are great case studies out there. Um, so if people want to learn more, uh, there is a lot, a lot of content there. So Sparkplug defines a so-called topic namespace. It defines a data model and a structure. It defines uh, extensible process variable payload. This means uh, you can add um, additional context if needed. One can also add data that is, um, that is for example, proprietary uh, to their own factory and so on to Sparkplug easily. And this is huge, it defines MQTT state management. Um, and we will talk about this also very soon, what this means, but one of the, let's say, weaknesses of a pure MQTT solution compared to Sparkplug is, um, solution is that MQTT alone um, does not really know that this is a Sparkplug device. And so uh, with Sparkplug, you get this kind of state management on top. So Sparkplug has some unique features. Some of the, for example, continuous session awareness, report by exception. And this is something that is huge that I want to mention, uh, mention uh, briefly. So if you have traditional um, protocols like Modbus, uh, this kind of poll response protocols, you have a situation that you poll for data or the protocol calls for data usually every few milliseconds or, or at least every few seconds. This means a lot of bandwidth is used, a lot of computing power is used, even if there's no state up, update, even if a value, even if a tag didn't change, um, and you're still using a lot of bandwidth. This is a huge kill, this is a huge problem if you have a remote site, you want to connect over the internet, or also if you just have a database or if you have a data lake, because if you put in all of the data you already have, you're basically polluting your system um, and it's getting more expensive and harder to maintain. Sparkplug, on the contrary, uses a concept called report by exception. This means any Sparkplug system uh, or component in the system only reports data, data changes if something really changed. So for example, if you have a tag, um, something like a, like a simpler temperature sensor, only if there is a significant change uh, in temperature, the data will be published to the Sparkplug um, let's say a system, and then it will be distributed. So we've seen uh, basically savings in bandwidth of, of way more than 90%. And uh, so we have also some reports of customers who save more than 99%. And later on, we also see a, a survey summary of a survey we did recently. And you will see that uh, compared to Modbus, MQTT and Sparkplug-based solutions really have a lot of advantages, especially when it comes to, to these aspects. So Sparkplug is basically a communication protocol that brings interoperability by having a consistent data format. And 
this is, as I said, this is huge because this allows for um, in, for plug and play interoperability. And then last but not least, Sparkplug provides auto discovery. Also again, this is huge for a plug and play experience, but any kind of Sparkplug device, uh, Sparkplug um, enabled PLC uh, or gateway, you can just bring into the system and, Spark and the Sparkplug system will pick that up automatically. So you get this kind of auto discovery um, of devices and applications as soon as this is as soon as this is joined um, in the system. So how does a spark plug architecture look like? And uh, here this picture really shows everything you need to know how a spark plug is used. So what you will see here on the left side, we still have the OT landscape. We have our devices, we have our sensors, we have things like OPC UA, Modbus, we have uh, digital inputs, digital outputs, analogous input and analogous output. So in uh, the spark plug vocabulary, this is called, these are called devices and sensors. So, um, so a device really could be anything. It could be a machine uh, directly that is spark plug enabled or it could be um, any, let's say, uh, abstraction of that. Sensors, of course, uh, should be pretty self-explanatory. But what is also really interesting is that OPC UA applications um, and, and devices that are OPC UA enabled can be easily brought into a Sparkplug architecture. The same is true for Modbus and for a lo lot of other uh, protocols and, and field buses. Because there are these so-called EON nodes that are called edge of network nodes, which are usually gateways. And these kind of edge of network nodes are the gateways that bring existing applications and data into this kind of MQTT world where you have this, this central data broker that is just pushing data where it needs to be at the time it needs to be. And and the same is also true for PLCs. So uh, usually PLCs, uh, especially if they're Sparkplug enabled, can also act as an edge of network node. Um, and the same is true for devices. And all of these connect to a so-called MQTT broker, uh, which is in the middle of the architecture uh, and which is responsible for distributing the data from the OT side to the IT side, but also from the IT side to the OT side, or also for providing data from gateway to a PLC and so on. So you, the, the kind of spaghetti architecture we saw in the beginning is now gone away by introducing this kind of MQTT broker here in the middle. So uh, what is special about Sparkplug is that there is a so-called SCADA or also IIoT host, um, which is Sparkplug enabled, that is acting as the basically overseer of the whole uh, state of of anything. So basically the SCADA system, just by connecting to the MQT broker, can get a clear picture of all the tags the system has and um, and really understands up to the device and sensor level uh, what the health is of the specific participants and also what's happening there. What is also interesting is there are so-called MQTT application nodes, because what we've seen today in modernization, a huge uh, thing many companies are looking for is making sure they can easily adapt and bring in new applications and can make use of the data. So very often, and we've seen this with customers a number of times, that there are some new requirements of data analytics, for example, and applications are brought into and being developed um, that need to have a subset of the data. And you can bring any MQTT application to the MQTT broker um, and consume the spark, plot, the spark plot data and then do something meaningful with it without disrupting anything from the other participants and from the other applications in the system. And um, so, and also these days, there are many MES systems that are spark plot enabled by default. The same is true for historians but also analytic systems. And of course, for applications that are being developed in-house very often or by some third parties, 
there are open source libraries for any programming language available to consume and produce Sparkplug data and make sure companies can develop their own applications uh, and make use of the data they already have in the system. Now let's dig a bit deeper into all the components uh, we, we see here. The first is the SCADA IIoT host. And I briefly mentioned it already. This is the application that is responsible for monitoring and controlling MQT Edge of Network nodes. And it also maintains a continuous session state awareness of all participants. So this means the SCADA host knows exactly if a machine is online or offline, and it knows that in, actually in, in milliseconds, like in the shortest time frame possible, uh, because the way of M how MQTT works, because it has this kind of push notification style of data transfer. And so as soon as if anything goes wrong, the SCADA IIoT host knows that and gets a notification that, for example, a PLC is offline or some data was not sent or any other problem that, that arose. And uh, the SCADA IoT host has really the overview of everything. It's not responsible for establishing a direct communication to the systems though. And this is a huge difference to many of the existing systems in factories because the SCADA IIoT host system is not polling for data. It's a key difference. With MQTT, any device, any PLC, any sensor is pushing data themselves um, as soon as there's a change. And, um, and this scales really well. So we've seen deployments with uh, 50,000 or even hundreds of thousands of uh, tag updates per second, uh, but only the tags that have a change in data which makes it much more scalable than existing approaches. And uh, also in Sparkplug, as I said, the devices, Azure Network, SCADA, IT host connects to a central MQT data broker to publish and subscribe to data. Um, and this allows really the report by exception principle I, I talked about. Very likely the most important participants you will see in any Sparkplug systems are the call of edge of network nodes. So these edge of network nodes provide the physical and logical gateway function for devices that don't implement Sparkplug themselves. And I've yet, I've yet need to see a greenfield project where somebody really starts from scratch and, um, and can use things like Sparkplug from scratch with all of the things of the devices, all of the machines. The reality is there is a, Basically, this kind of brownfield approach. There are many systems in there. There are many vendors in here. The equipment sometimes is very old um, and is very likely not Sparkplug enabled. Uh, if you have a machine that is more than 30 years old, chances are that it's not Sparkplug enabled. But this is not a problem because the so-called edge of network nodes bring in the legacy world um, basically with any protocol into the Sparkplug world. Uh, so you can bring in your OPC UA applications, your OPC UA enabled machines, PLCs, and so on, but also things like Modbus um, or proprietary PLC protocols uh, to connect to any Sparkplug architecture. And there's a lot of software out there. There are vendors out there that sell you physical devices that act as edge of network nodes. There are vendors who sell you software. There's open source software available. Um, or one can easily write um, your, basically your own edge of network node application. Uh, so there's really a, a lot of options out there. Um, usually for starters, it's the best is just to go with a vendor. Um, and chances are that, you exist, that your existing vendors already support Sparkplug and can act as a edge of network node, um, depending on of what kind of gateway vendor you're using, of course. And then, of course, we have the devices. The devices are very important, obviously, because this is something that is being monitored, that is being used, um, and, and the devices are connected to the so-called EON nodes. Um, and devices and sensors are really the key endpoints in any industrial automation system. 
and devices and sensors connect with uh, the edge of network node as i mentioned they push the data from these devices into the spark plug protocol and this can really be anything um, so depending on the, the kind of industry you work you work in this will heavily uh, differ to other industries of course then there is the mqt application nodes so MQTT application nodes can produce and consume sparkling messages, but they don't act as a SCADA or IIoT host. So uh, for example, uh, this might be an application that is uh, basically getting sensors from uh, sensor data from machines, and then it's doing pr predictive maintenance, um, uh, lear machine learning, for example. This would be a very popular use case uh, we see. And like typical application nodes you see in many factories these days are MES systems, of course, historians and uh, analytic systems, but very often also these kind of proprietary systems. And this can really be, be anything. And last but not least, also things like the MQT broker is very important. This is really the central piece of any Sparkbrick architecture. Because an MQT broker is a central data distribution point in our Sparkbrook architecture. So there are some requirements though. So on the one side, you need a 100% compliant uh, MQTT 3.1.1 broker. Sounds easy, but the problem is especially many proprietary MQT brokers do not support all features. For example, retain messages, last will and testament and quality of service levels. So for people who have never heard of MQTT, this might not sound like a huge deal, but it actually is. And uh, especially in compliant MQTT brokers like Microsoft Azure IoT Hub, but as well as AWS IoT, it's really hard to use Sparkplug with them uh, because they do not support the full specification. They don't give all the guarantees the MQTT protocol dictates that one should have. And they actually have a kind of almost proprietary version of MQTT that really doesn't play very nice with Sparkplug. If you're using brokers like open source brokers like Mosquito, um, this is no problem. And if you have, let's say, mission critical requirements, then an MQTT broker like HiveMQ might be the best fit, especially when it comes to features like high availability and making sure data is really never lost and um, you don't have a downtime then um, yeah, Hive, this is something HiveMQ basically earns the money with by providing an MQT broker infrastructure that just works under any circumstance so uh, businesses can operate 24-7, 365 days a year without any downtime and without any maintenance window. But there are MQT brokers from basically free, free of charge like Mosquito to, um, to commercial systems like HiveMQ available depending on what kind of basically business you run and how mission critical the use case is. So when it comes to HiveMQ, um, so this is what, what we provide here is, is an MQT broker and an MQT platform actually that provides high availability is 100% MQTT compliant, which only a few software products on the market are. Um, scalability, uh, so we, we having is, is operated in factories from basically 10 devices up to like literally thousands of devices across the globe um, with 50 plus factories connected uh, also in a feder federated way, um, also with cloud systems involved. Uh, so you really see that that depends a lot on the use case. Also the same having software used in factories is used by most connected car platforms in the world. So for example, if you buy a German car, you very likely will use HiveMQ under the hood when it operates. But the same is also true for um, if you're from, from the US. So if you drive basically a Ford car, uh, the autonomic system that is used for connecting the car uses HiveMQ and there's a case study available you can see about more about the scalability, but basically HiveMQ scales from basically one device to 10 million devices with the same installation. Um, so also when it comes to factories, very often we see 
that only a few workloads are being added to Sparkplug and over time it replaces existing workloads and existing systems and with having to basically just uh, switch to the broker and uh, there's really no, no problem here. So you can start with one tag uh, and then scale it up to millions of tags easily. Also, Hanke provides what we call observability, so making it possible to find the needle in the haystack. Uh, and what that means is if there's any problem with any application, any device, any PLC, any gateway, you will need to have answers fast. And having you provide you the answers, what went wrong, what kind of system is having trouble, troubles adjusting or producing data, and making it possible for you to find the answers to these kind of problems that are very hard to debug, especially in production. Uh, of course, uh, so our main clients are Fortune 500 companies, so uh, enterprise security is of course a must. Uh, so there's really no re there's really no excuse for not having a secure system. Um, and even if everything is locally, security must come first. And so, of course, Hanku integrates with all existing security systems uh, that you will find on the market uh, today. And of course, also integration of OT and IT systems with the what we call extension SDK. So even things like Apache Kafka that are also nowadays used a lot, um, or database or data lakes can be integrated easily, but also OT systems. So, again, to summarize, how, how would a Sparkplug architecture look like? So, instead of the spaghetti architecture, what you gain with Sparkplug and MQDT is, a, is this kind of centralized data messaging uh, you get for decoupling all of your devices, all of your gateways with all your applications. So, again, the flexibility uh, that is needed in order to modernize your factory. And the thing is, you don't need to get started and you don't need to get all in. What we see very often is users and customers start by introducing one, usually not mission critical use case, bring in the data into the Sparkplug architecture and then consume it either locally or in the cloud and move the data where it needs to be. And very often after that initial proof of concept is done, um, we see a lot of adoption um, also for the mission critical use cases. And you don't need to switch from OPC UA or Modbus or all these other technologies. With a gateway, you can just bring in uh, the existing data, the existing applications, the existing uh, basically devices and everything into this kind of Sparkplug architecture and can use MQDT and then also can basically bridge everything to the cloud as needed. So last but not least, I'd like to share something with you. And in October 2021, we did a survey with decision makers in the industry. And it was a survey about industrial IoT trends and technology adoption. And one question was, which I found very insightful, is which of the following protocols do you use today to connect your equipment? And you see here, the people who answered were very, very often uh, people who were running the whole factory, who were software architects, um, but most of the people are from the OT side and also decision makers um, and people who are responsible for modernizing the, the factories. And not surprisingly, many of the people answered that Modbus was in heavy use and of course also OPC UA. But what was really interesting is that MQDT was used by um, basically 50% of the participants already, which is even more than Modbus, which surprised me. And uh, that the first place, um, of course, HTTP, which is the protocol for the internet, uh, was used a lot. And surprisingly, only 5.7% already used Sparkplug. Um, but keep an eye on that chart, because when it gets really interesting, it was another question we asked. Which of the following protocols do you consider strategic to fulfill your IIoT strategy? And MQDT was, of course, strategic by more than half of the people, but almost 30% of the people considered spark plugs uh, strategically for basically connecting their factory and the data in the factory. 
And if we compare it with what we see here, that only 5% use Sparkle already, but almost 30% find strategic. Um, and this is something that really shows that there is a lot of appetite in the industry for Sparkplug. But this also shows, of course, this is still very early days. Um, but I would be really curious to see what the results today are, because based on the project I've seen in the last year, there's a lot of appetite for MQTT Sparkplug based architectures. And um, the best brands in the world use it today for connecting their factories. So it's just a very brief overview of the ecosystem. And there are um, a lot of other vendors out there that are not on this list. But when it comes to Azure Network Nodes, you see really a lot of vendors out there, also SCADA vendors. There are MQTT brokers out there. Um, and there are also MQTT applications not out there. For example, um, Hybyte, Canary Labs, who provide um, the, uh, basically kind of historians, um, OC Soft, of course, and, and others who support Sparkle out of the box. And uh, a lot of major vendors also recently announced that MQT Sparkplug is very high on the agenda. Um, and uh, so this is something that is, is really great to see, especially also that major PLC vendors are now working on native MQTT Sparkplug integrations. So as a next step, if you think Sparkplug is something you want to dive deep into, uh, you can get a copy of uh, what we call the Sparkplug Essentials ebook, where you get all of the details, how Sparkplug works, how you can integrate it into your systems uh, available for free. But also feel free to book a demo to see how Hiveview supports the Sparkplug specification. Uh, if you really want to get a quick start and want to have experts show you how you can benefit from Sparkplug. Um, also, if you, have, if you are new to MQDT, if you want to get started easily, hyphenq.com has some very good resources um, I would recommend. Um, and also ebooks, all free of charge. So you can check it out yourself. And also, of course, feel free to connect with me after this webinar. And I'm happy to guide you and connect you with the right people. OK, so. I think we now have still time for some questions, so I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Well, thank you, Dominic. Before we do get started with the question and answer session, I would like to take just a second here and remind our viewers that if you have a question for Dominic and you haven't submitted it yet via the webinar interface, now is the time to do so. We have gotten in a few questions during your uh, presentation, Dominic, and I'll start uh, working through those as others come in. Um, one of the first questions we got uh, in was asking if you can explain what the difference is between Sparkplug and OPC UA. That's a good question. And um, so uh, Sparkplug and OPC UA, they serve a bit different purposes, but also the same purposes. So OPC UA is here to stay, of course. Um, it's used, this is a technology used a lot in, in factories these days, and many vendors support it out of the box. And while OPC UA really wanted to bring interoperability between systems, their reality is quite a bit different for most companies. Um, and everybody who worked on integrations with OPC UA know, knows it's not that trivial, unfortunately. Um, but Sparkplug has some, let's say, key characteristics that are different. Uh, so for example, um, as I said, Sparkplug has this kind of MQTT-based architecture with a centralized MQTT broker based on publish subscribe. So it has all these edge of network nodes, the, the SCADA IoT host, and so on. With uh, OPC UA, you traditionally have this client-server-based architecture that uses TCP IP and also HTTP SOAP um, as underlying technologies. So actually, with OPC UA, you get this kind of spaghetti architecture I showed in the beginning, which is something a lot of companies now want to move away these days. Technically, um, OPC UA also supports MQTT. Um, I would be really curious to see that live in action. So if somebody has that running into their production system, I'm really curious to hear that. 
because I know there's a specification out there, but I have not seen any vendor supported out of the box. Um, so, so yeah, but in, in theory, you could also use OPC UI with MQTT, but it's not compatible with Sparkplug. You can bridge OPC UA to Sparkplug though, um, and bring in your existing OPC UA systems. And uh, Sparkplug uses also the, from a security uh, standpoint, M uses the MQTT security model, which is based on uh, what is used also in the in the internet, which all companies from basically Google um, and others, what they use for, for securing the internet. Um, this is also used by Sparkplug, uh, basically TLS uh, certificates and so on, which you can also use with OPC UA. So from a security standpoint, uh, you can use basically both are secure. So this is really good. And um, so when it comes to semantics, this is a huge plus of OPC UA uh, because it has this kind of fixed structure, structured data objects and endpoints. So, which is pretty good. It has a, also a pretty complex model on top of that. Um, but in reality, it really doesn't give you the flexibility needed or what main components are looking for. Sparkplug has a much easier data model, which makes it easier to ingest also into applications. Um, but you can also bring on the semantics you have with um, OPC UA. So, here we have just a few key differences. There are blog posts available on the internet that really dive into the details of. OPC UA versus Sparkplug. So I would really say um, test both um, if you're unsure. What we've heard from many companies is that while OPC UA has a lot more to offer, the flexibility to get started with Sparkplug is really something um, many companies really value. Okay, thanks for explaining that, Dominic. You know, speaking of uh, getting into this next question, you were mentioning uh, security aspects of Sparkplug, and this other question we got is asking if security can be added to Sparkplug. Um, yeah, absolutely. So as I said, so it uses basically the um, the transport layer security that is used uh, also in the internet. So Sparkplug is based on MQTT, um, and it uses TCP/IP which means you can use TLS with certificates and so on. And usually, but this is usually not enough because what you really want to do is, besides um, the transport security, making sure that everything is encrypted, what you send over the wire, usually also companies want to make sure that policies are in place. It means, for example, a PLC that is supposed um, to only um, um, basically provide data that it cannot be used for basically um, modifying data um, and so on. So this kind of policies can be rolled out on an MQT broker in a centralized way um, with a permission framework. And this is something um, having your customers use a lot to make sure that you get the least privileged access by any system. So if a historian is only, should only be able to read data, you want to make sure as soon as it authenticates on the MQT broker, that you also set the right permissions. Um, and this is, these are really the things that um, are not as important in proof of concepts, but this is of course very important if you go to production. And uh, this is something a professional MQTT platform should provide. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Um, this next question is asking about uh, work with uh, HiveMQ and cloud suppliers. And this uh, viewer is asking uh, if HiveMQ can work with cloud providers like Azure, Microsoft's Azure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I said, in general, yes. So, um, it, so there are of course these components of the shelf components like um, IoT Hub that are really tough to use with things like Sparkplug. Um, and this has multiple reasons. So you usually, especially if you run a production system, you don't want to have a reliance on cloud-based infrastructure because if you produce something locally, you really want to make sure that you don't need internet access. Um, so what you see these days a lot is a so-called federated architecture. So, so for example, you run MQTT infrastructure in the factories uh, but then you also run a cloud infrastructure um, which where all the factories are connected. 
And on the same technology, it's also with Sparkplug. So you can connect devices to an MQT broker on a factory and connect the MQT broker with Sparkplug. Um, also basically chain MQT brokers local, locally and also in the cloud. And, and in order to do that, you need the full MQTT specification. So in case of many of our customers, for example, um, uh, we have pharma customers in the US who are doing exactly that. So they run, on every factory, they run local hyphen queue brokers, use Sparkplug locally, but then also run on Azure um, a hyphen queue installation that is basically run on Azure infrastructure. Um, and, and this is, and then the broker locally and the broker in the cloud is connected over MQTT Sparkplug. So this is something you will see a lot, um, but this off the shelf components like um, Azure IoT Hub usually don't work out that well. So, but if you run the same MQT platform in the cloud and locally, you can just connect it and have a kind of almost hybrid cloud and federated environment. Um, so this is something I really would consider, especially if you are strategically running on Azure or on AWS or on Google Cloud, um, make sure that the main communication channel uh, is not basically locked into one of these cloud providers. And Sparkplug is a protocol that can be used with any MQT vendor. Uh, so you can even run this in a multi-cloud fashion. So this is something um, yeah, I would, would ask people to consider when running in the cloud. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Uh, looks like we got time for one more question. Uh, and this question is asking, how do you go about ensuring that the data you're collecting is reliable and securely available and that it's also scalable? Yeah, so I think the key is really to have uh, MQT platform that supports a kind of elastic clustering. So the worst thing that can happen is if you deploy a software and then you find out that you cannot scale it up uh, more and then you're basically locked in. So what our customers are doing is they usually start with um, installation of two nodes for high availability reason that is clustered. This means if one of the servers would fail, um, no data would be lost. And you can even cluster it with three or even four nodes. Um, also in geographically different um, um, regions to make sure that uh, data is really never lost even in terms of a disaster. And the same cluster technology can also be used then to add new basically nodes to the cluster like new MQT brokers that, that are part of the same cluster. Um, this means if you if the workload increases, if more machines are connected and so on, you can just add more installations of the same software and then scale up and still be highly available. And so you really get the best of all these worlds um, with that. And yeah, and this you can, and, and the cool thing is you can use the same approach locally, but also in the cloud, as, a, as, a, as I said before, in this kind of federated um, deployments, um, because then the complexity also decreases. If we can run it in the cloud, in the factory, um, and really everywhere with the same principles, this makes life easy. And then you can also really scale things up pretty easily. Okay, well, thank you for joining me for this webinar, Dominic. And thanks, of course, to all of our viewers. Now, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question today, you will receive a response via email from Hive, in, excuse me, from Hive MQ. In the meantime, thanks again for joining us.